Okay. I'm Peretz Rodman. I'm speaking to you from Yerushalayim, where I've lived most of my life. But in an earlier stage of my life, I was a graduate student and before that an undergraduate at Brandeis University. And I had the good fortune of being there as a grad student when Nate arrived um, as a freshman and uh, immediately made friends with everybody and still is friends with all those people. I was until recently. Um, and uh, it's a bittersweet um, um, honor to be able to dedicate this learning to his memory. Um, my academic background is in part in Hebrew language and Hebrew, I have a degree in Hebrew literature and, and, um, and I'm trained as a Masorti rabbi, what you folks in North America call a conservative rabbi. So that gives you an idea of my training and work. Um, and not my work, it didn't tell you anything about my work. Um, uh, I, um, what I propose to explore with you today is the, um, first of all, some of the connections between the language of the Tanakh and the, the, the literary expression of the Sidur. They are so tightly, intimately uh, intertwined. And then, with that as the background, I want to look at, and some of you are, have already maybe looked at the source sheets that you have access to already, and I think that uh, you're just going to put them, a uh, link to them in the, um, in the chat. Um, if you've already looked at them, you know that we're going to look at some of the ways in which the language that describes Eretz Yisrael and things in Eretz Yisrael get transferred to describing Shabbat, and we're going to try to explore what that means and what the, what the literary tradition um, the rabbinic tradition, literary tradition, did with that and why. Um, not that I know why, so we can talk about our ideas about why, but I can point to the phenomena and we can have a conversation, I hope. So that's where I hope to go in the next hour or so. Uh, uh, Mira admitted to me that she won't cut us off after an hour, but I'm going to try to get everything done because that's a long time to sit in front of your screen. Um, I'll try to monitor chat for questions. Um, and... Uh, um, but I'm happy to take guidance, Mira, if you see something in the chat that ought to be addressed and you want to break in and tell me, that would be great. Great. So first of all, I would like to um, point out that the folks who wrote our classic early rabbinic um, tefillot and brachot, my prayers, blessings, um, in the centuries after the downfall of the Second Commonwealth, the destruction of Bait Shani of the Second Temple, they knew Tanakh in and out. We know this from reading Midrash, where they'll come up with the most obscure references and think that some audience could understand it, which is even more amazing. And, um, and I also learned once from Professor Moshe Barasher, many years ago in a lecture at Brandeis, he pointed out to me that, to, to me, to the audience, um, that, in, um, that the language of classic, early classic rabbinic tefillah of prayers including the brachot, the blessing uh, formula, formulae, um, are very often deliberately not in the language that was spoken in Eretz Yisrael by Jews in the time of the Mishnah and the classic Midrash, but, uh, and beyond, to the extent that Jews continued to speak Hebrew past the time of the Mishnah. We don't really know when and where people switched to Aramaic. It's probably different places, different times. Um, they deliberately used... Um, um, rabbinic, uh, sorry, biblical Hebrew um, to do that. So let's see. Um, uh, here we go. I think this is what I want to share with you. Um, I'm going to try to make it possible for you not to have to open the, um, uh, not to have to open the, I can close that for you. Not to have to open your, uh, your source texts uh, yourself, um, but uh, of course you're welcome to do that if you would rather play that game and that way and you can move around, uh, look back and not have to stick with where I am. Mishnah Brachot, right? We're talking the year 200, 220 or so. They're legislating what benedictions, what brachot gets said over the consumption of different kinds of foods. This is the first Mishnah in the sec sixth um, chapter of uh, Masechet Brachot in the Mishnah. Ketzad mevarachin al haperot. What what kind of benedictions, kind of brachot do you say over eating fruits? Well, it depends on where they what they grow from. They grow from the ground. They grow al perot ha'ilan omer borei pri ha'etz. 
Now, in the language that folks spoke in Palestine in, um, in uh, the second, third century, the regular word for two is an Ilan. But as we know from the study of Etz HaChayim in, the, in Gan Eden and Etz HaDa'atovara, the trees in Genesis were always called Etz. And in general, right, they're called, and throughout biblical Hebrew, they're called Etz. So it's a deliberate use of an archaic version of the language in the blessing. And they knew that archaic, for, the, for them, was slightly archaic literary language inside and out. Um, Al-Hapat, later on in the same Mishnah, Al-Hapat, on, a, on the loaf, on a loaf of bread, one says, Hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz, means on bread, in other words. Hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. And that comes right out of Psalm 24. You make the grass grow for the cattle and herbage for man's labors, that he may bring forth food. Lechem can mean food, not just bread, out of the earth. So they're using biblical language or infusing their prayers with biblical language. Let's take a look at another example here. Birkat Yotzer Or is a case of taking consciously and, and pointedly citing. Um, biblical verses as proof texts um, or as, or as um, support um, for what's said in classical uh, um, liturgy. At the end of Birkat Yotzer Or, the first of the two blessings we say before Kriyat Shema in the morning service in Shaharit, we say of God that God renews the work of creation each day. It's an interesting theological problem for people who've studied a little bit of, you know, Astronomy, earth science, you know, geography, ge- 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 whatever, you know, you, how do you say that God renews the work of creation each day? Hamachadesh betuvo, the best answer was provided by Pope Francis, but we won't get into that. If you want, write to me later and I'll tell you what the Pope said. Hamachadesh betuvo b'chol yom tamid ma'asev reshit. Right? You, God, renew in your, he renews in his goodness every day, tamid, forever, always, ma'asev reshit, the work of reshit, the work of creation. Ka'amur, and how do we know that God renews the world every day? Because in that psalm, oh, I forgot to finish writing which psalm it was. It's Psalm 104, verse 14, I think. Um, but I might be wrong about that. Le'ose orim gedolim, ki le'olam chasto. God is called the one who makes. The, you could read it as a substance of a noun, maker, the maker of the great lights. And from Genesis, uh, we know that that means the sun and the moon, and maybe the stars. Le'ose orim gedolim, ki le'olam chasto. But ose for rabbinic Hebrew is a present tense verb. In biblical Hebrew, it's not exactly present tense. It's kind of tenseless, but that's another story. But they deliberately read the biblical verse through their eyes as being a present tense verb. The one who makes the great lights didn't make, not made them once, makes them now. It's playful, probably, you know, uh, fully, they're fully aware that they're being playful with reading the verse. Or... Um, at the end of every service where we uh, enthrone God over, or we, we ask that God be enthroned as a real king over the, over the world um, uh, and, and repeat the, the word king or the verb related to it. I could have translated it reign, but I made it into be king or make king. Right? And you will soon reign over them forever. Kingship is yours. God is going to be king. God's going to be king. God's with three different ways of saying it. And then a proof text. Adonai kakatuv b'Torah Tzecha in Exodus 15. Adonai imloch leolam va'ed. God will be, will rule. Maybe it's rules, but again, in rabbinic, in rabbinic eyes, that's a future tense. And so it's Adonai imloch leolam va'ed. God will reign, will be king forever and ever. B'nei and it also says in the Bible, but not in the Torah, We bring a text that says that one day God will be king, which is kind of surprising, right? And it's even more surprising to say that someday God's name will be one and God will be one. Didn't we say that God was one in Shema Yisrael? And like, but the prophet Zechariah took issue with that and says that as long as there are many things that are worshipped in the world, many different values that are ranked highest by people in the way they live their lives. There isn't really just one God in the world, but someday, someday. So biblical verses as proof texts. Um, there are also, um, there are also uh, 
um, cases in which the peop- uh, the rabbis put together um, 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 let me pause share here, stop share. Um, rabbis put together um, verses culled from different places as a new poem, a kind of collage. After I published an article about it, calling them collages, I learned from another article that a friend of mine had written and I had missed that they're called Cento, C-E-N-T-O. But it's a new poem of found materials from the Bible that is built to make a different message than any of those verses individually make. Um, and we also find... Um, uh, reworked versions of, uh, of um, biblical texts in the opening of Birkat Yotzer Or, which we spoke about earlier, the one in the morning before Kriyat Shema, we say that God is Yotzer Or, forms light, and creates darkness. Ose Shalom, creates peace, and creates everything, which doesn't exactly match with peace. And that's because the original verse from Isaiah, as I recall, is Ose shalom ra. God makes both well-being, shalom is really well-being, not, not the absence of violence or war, but well-being and wholeness, and creates ra as well, evil in the sense of bad stuff happening to you. And that's not something that people wanted to include in their prayer, so they airbrushed it and played with the verse. So the, the biblical verses are material with which the authors of classical um, rabbinic prayer worked. They sometimes quoted them, they sometimes reworked them, they sometimes borrowed phrases, and sometimes you discover if you're reading something in the Bible that, oh, that phrase comes from there. I, I didn't realize that. Oh. Okay, Hamotzi Lechem in Haaretz comes from a, a, you know, a line in a psalm. Um, now let's look at the texts that um, I sent out before that you may have also already. Um, and yes, Betsy notes that that is not on either of the source sheets that you shared with us. That's true. If you'd like that, uh, I'm happy to send it to you. My email address is my name at gmail.com. Parrots Rodman at gmail, like what most of humanity uses in the English speaking world anyway. So you're welcome to write and ask me for anything here. Um, let's look at the text that you do have in, uh, in front of you already, perhaps. Um, Sorry, this takes me just a second. I want to get the right one. Part B, part, part A. There we go. That should do it. Okay. So let's skip up to the top. Here we go. Um, oh, wait. Oh, no, 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 no. Because it's your R. Sorry. You have that already. I don't know what I did wrong here. I hope I didn't screw this up. Um, let's start. That's with B, hmm, okay. That's a problem. I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment and figure out where I went wrong and get the right thing for you. I apologize, I have. Um, okay, let me start by suggesting that the first thing we're going to look at, as soon as I find it, is the, um, um, the text of the middle blessing of the Amidah, um, the one about the sanctity of the specific day, for Shabbat, and, and on Shabbat we have four different versions of it with four different themes. Um, the, uh, um, there's, um, there's one for Mariv, there's one for Shahari, there's one for, um, here we go, part A. And I want to, find that for you and don't know why I messed that up before. And um, we're going to look at the one for the evening in which, let's see. I'm really quite confused by this. Oh, okay, good. There we go. I apologize for the on my lack of uh, fluidity in working this technology. You'd think that by now, after all these months of pandemic years, uh, I'd be better at it. Birkat Kedushat Hayom, the blessing of Kedushat Hayom. The, um, uh, it is not the seventh blessing, it's the fourth blessing of the Friday night, of the seven in the Friday night Amidah prayer. We can correct that. 
I've already done some color coding for you. You sanctified the seventh day for your name, for your glory, for your good name. Tachlit, which means the completion, the end, maybe the goal of of the making of heavens and earth, right? Which is a way of saying everything in the world. You sanctified it and you blessed it more than all other days. We got back to that idea again. You blessed it and you sanctified it from all other times. And so it says in your Torah, right? The language of how we praise God for giving us this wonderful Shabbat is taken right out of this passage. We rework the language and then we cite the passage that it's from. They were completed. It's everything, heaven and earth and everything in between. Their whole array. Mayachal, same verb, he completed. Elohim at Bayom Hashavi'im Alachto Asher Asa, he completed the work that he um, had been doing. Bayishbot, and God rested on the seventh day, Bayom Hashavi'i, Bikom Alachto Asher Asa, Bayavarech Lehim at Yom Hashavi'i, Bayakadesh Oto. So the idea that God is blessing and sanctifying Shabbat appeared in the text, but we adumbrated it, we, we anticipated it in the, in, the, in the text that came before the quotation. And I won't even bother to go through it, but you see that in the lines that follow, in the Hebrew I've, I've uh, highlighted, Kaddishenu Kodshecha Mekaddishen Mekaddish, the idea that God sanctified Shabbat is, is repeated several times, but notice who does the sanctifying in the third one there, the next to last one. Shabbat Kodshecha, your holy Shabbat, you've sanctified it. V'yanuchu Yisrael Mekaddishen Shemecha, those who declare your name sacred, who sanctify your name. You sanctified Shabbat, we sanctify your name by keeping your Shabbat. It becomes a, uh, what we call in Hebrew, mishak gomlin. It becomes a, an interaction, a, a game of ping pong back and forth. You sanctify that, we sanctify you. We sanctify you. We can't make God, declare God sacred and therefore it's so, but we can make recognition of the sanctity of God and we end with the blacha with Baruch Atah. Hashem mekadesh Shabbat. Praised are you, blessed are you, Adonai, who sanctifies Shabbat. So again, the language of, of the passage in Genesis, the first verses of Genesis chapter 2, are used by the authors, author, authors of this, of this um, prayer. Let's look on at, um, I have to go to the next one. Hold on, we'll stop sharing this and let's share something else. And I think I'm actually going to get it quickly this time for you. Part B, part B, there we go. Okay. Except that that didn't work. Because that's not part B, that's part A. So what did I do wrong? Oh, because I'm looking at the wrong thing. You're looking at the right thing. Okay. All right. I'm going to get the hang of this eventually. Rest and inherited land holding. There's a phrase in... um, in uh, the Torah that gets played with many times in many ways, not only in classic rabbinic Hebrew uh, prayers, but also in later medieval poems and beautim. It's a pair of words, and we're going to look at them one, one at a time. The first one is the idea of menucha, right? We refer to Shabbat as a day of menucha, which we interpret as rest and we think of as an abstraction. But the rest, the menucha in the Torah is rarely an abstraction. Genesis 49, 15 from Yaakov's blessings to his sons. He says to Yisachar, Yisachar, gamor, chamor garem, rovetz ben hamishpetayim. Yisachar is a strong-boned ass, writes JPS, crouching among the sheepfolds. When he saw vayar, and he saw menucha, kitov, he saw that Menucha was good. Veta'aretz ki na'ama, and the land, presumably the land of Kana'an, was pleasant. Vayet shichmo, he, he turned his, his uh, shoulder, lisbol, to carry, to bear something. Vayihi lamas oved. He became a, what you technically call a thrall, somebody who works, uh, works the, uh, uh, because you've been You've been drafted to work. Let's look at the uh, several translations of that. When he saw how goodly was Menucha, look how the Jewish Publication Society translates Menucha security, and how pleasant was the land. He bent his shoulder to the burden and became a toiling serf. Security and land are parallel. Menucha, 
rest and and um, haaretz are the two parallel pieces in two parallel lines. What's that about? Well, look how Robert Alter reads it. He saw that the homestead, menucha, he translates homestead. We thought it was something abstract, rest, but or, or maybe security, which is abstract, but homestead is very physical. He saw that the homestead was goodly, that the land was delightful, and how Everett Fox, whose unique approach to translating, by the way, all of Everett Fox's biblical translations, the Torah and the early prophets are now available on Safaria. It's just an amazing, wonderful addition to that amazing, wonderful site. He translates it more literally, and I think more usefully for us, Menucha is resting place. He saw how good the resting place was and how pleasant was the land, and then he went on to do what he did. So Menucha is a resting place. It's not something abstract. It's the place where you go, where you're at rest. Or in Numbers, chapter 10, we're looking at text number two now. Vayisu mehar Adonai. I usually don't write out the tetragrammaton. Um, I usually replace it with a hey and a gerish, and I neglected to do that here. I apologize. They marched from the mountain of the Lord a distance of three days. And the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord traveled in front of them on that three days journey. To seek out a menucha for them. It's clearly a place that they're going to be at rest, a resting place. Menucha is a place. In, in the Hebrew of the Torah. And again, also in Deuteronomy. One more time, and then we'll, I think we'll stop trying to prove this point. Moshe is speaking to B'nai Yisrael as they're on the verge of entering Kanaan, Eretz Kanaan, and he says to them, oh, it's sad what an old crotchety guy Moshe is in Deuteronomy. He's constantly berating the people. He was so good at the end of Numbers. He knows how to manipulate them exactly to do what, they, what he wants them to do, and he's brilliant, and he's and he's at his at the peak of his game and in Deuteronomy, he's a crotchety guy saying, you're going to screw up. You're going to really mess it up. I know you guys. I've known you for a long time. I've worked with you. you are, you're going to mess this up. You get the, 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 you know, an incredible opportunity. And I know you get, God's going to forgive you. It's going to work out okay, but you're going to miss it. So here he goes to them. Lo ta'asun, you shall not do. Kechol asher anachnu osim po hayom. As all, as all the things that we, like all the things that we do here today, here in the wilderness. Each one, whatever is right in his eyes. No, when you get there, you're going to be disciplined. You're going to be working together. You're going to follow orders. Because up to now, you guys in the wilderness, you've been impossible. Because you have not yet, until now, until this point, you have not come to the menucha, we've already established that that's a place, a resting place. The nachala that God is giving you. What is a nachala? If you know anybody who lives in a moshav, not a moshava, a real moshav, a semi, um, uh, um, wow, what's the right word for that? Semi-cooperative. Not a kibbutz, but a place where people own their own land, but work together, farming together. Most moshavim no longer do farming, and most of them become bedroom suburbs of big cities. But in theory, all of them were originally created so that people would have their own land, their own plot of land that they would farm. But the tractors and the heavy equipment, you wouldn't have to buy your own. It would be owned collectively. It's a semi-collective settlement. So... um, when you live in a moshav, the land that you get is called a nachala. The, and why? Because the land apportioned to each of the tribes in Eretz Yisrael was called its nachala. But it wasn't just the tribal land that was a nachala, because that was broken up into clan estates, and each of those is a nachala. Nachala, linchol, is to inherit. So a nachala is your, let's say, your patrimony, what you got from your father in a world in which only men inherited and passed on inheritance, you got from your father and you passed on to your son or sons. That's your nachala. And Moshe refers to Eretz Kna'an as ha-menucha v'ha-nachala. It's the place where you're going to be at rest and where you're going to take ownership and begin to pass it on from generation to generation. It's going to stay in the people, in the clans and in the tribes and in the larger people 
in, you know, for all time, we hopefully. That was what was hoped, of course, at the time. So notice the translations here. El HaMenuchav, El HaNachala, JPS sees it as a hendaides, as an idea that's two words joined by and, but it's really one idea, right? Like sick and tired. When you're sick and tired, you're neither ill nor fatigued. You're, put up, you're fed up with something. That's, that's hendaides, I believe. So Menuchav and Nachala, they translate a lot in haven. Robert Alter also, abiding a state. Everett Fox, who tries to give you the literal sense as much as possible of each of the Hebrew terms, leaves it as two terms. For you have not come until now to the resting place, to the inheritance that Adonai your God is giving you. Eretz Yisrael, Eretz Kanaan, as it was known before the Israelite tribes inherited it, in the, uh, took possession of it in the Torah, was to be a menucha venachala. It's the only time in the, in the Tanakh that those two are paired together. And they're paired as parallel terms. Let's see how they're used in um, later Hebrew, a little bit, later biblical Hebrew, but in a, in a moment, and then what happens to them in rabbinic, um, a classic rabbinic prayer first. Baruch Adonai Asher Natan Menucha, says Shlomo Solomon, as he's dedicating the first temple that he's just built on the hill in Yerushalayim, about a mile to my north. Baruch Adonai Asher Natan Menucha, Amo Yisrael. Once they finally, the, the, in the view of the Deuteronomistic author of Kings, the whole settlement enterprise is really only completed once the second king, or the third king, second in the Davidic line, gets to finally build the temple, bring the ark there, the people are worshiping in Yerushalayim, which according to the southern tribes is the great center, and, uh, and we're Yehudim, we're descendants of that southern tribe of Judea. Baruch Adonai Hashem Natan Menuchalem Yisrael, finally, once we're here, at the temple is built, now it's done, now we're at rest. Right? But what's that Menucha? It's the acquisition of um, um, of Eretz Canaan, of, of Yerushalayim and the building of a temple there. The same language is used to describe Shabbat as we begin to look through some of the classic and later um, prayers. So for example, in um, the Amidah, we looked at the middle part of the Amidah for the evening earlier on, just looking at how the language plays back and forth. Um, here, we see that um, uh, Shabbat is called Yom Menucha. Ata echad, you are one or unique. Veshimcha echad, your name is one or unique. Umi cha'amacha Yisrael goy echad ba'aretz, you. And who is like your people Israel, a unique people in all the earth, in the earth, on the earth. Tiferet gedula v'ateret yitshua, singular splendor, crown of salvation, Yom Menucha u'kedusha. Shabbat is described as a day of Menucha and of course Kedusha. We saw that in the, in the evening blessing, right? Now, the word that God, the idea that God sanctified Shabbat, that we who sanctify God's name sanctify, recognize the sanctity of God's Shabbat. It's a crucial idea in the, in the rabbinic concept of what Shabbat is about. It's not just a day to take off and, you know, kick back and not have to work. It's much more. It's about Menucha. But this menucha is not about a place at all. Shabbat doesn't need to be observed in a specific place. Let's jump way, way, way ahead into the, uh, uh, either the 12th or the early 13th century to the Zemer, Baruch El Elyon. Right? If you know that, Baruch El Elyon, Asher Natan Menucha, Lenaf Shenu Pidyon, Mased uh, this is Mish'et Vanacha. Blessed is the exalted God who gave Menucha, the Nafshenu Pidyon, right? Respite for our souls from calamity and woe. God will seek out Zion, the rejected city. How long will you torment a sighing soul? Shomer Shabbat, Habenim Habat, La'el Yeratsu, Kamincha al Machbat. Those who keep Shabbat, male and female, are as pleasing to God as a meal offering on a fire pan. Interesting that. Not only is there a reference here to um, menucha, but also that um, we, we sneak, sneak in references to the, to the temple at the same time. 
right? Just as uh, Shlomo had said, Sol King Solomon had said that the uh, the achievement of building and, and operating the Tanakh, the Tanakh, the Nikdash, the temple in Jerusalem, brought us fully to Menucha, to, to rest. So we think of our, 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 feel, our food here uh, on Shabbat, perhaps, we're hinting at that, is as pleasing to God as the meal offering on a pyre. And there's, there's also another line in there in that poem, which refers to Menucha and Nachala. The Shabbat morning blessing. Um, has a very funny, odd way of expressing how, what it was that God gave us or gives us Shabbat. Um, but it's not funny or, or, or odd um, at all in light of what we've just seen before. Mefichach, we say, therefore. Yefa'aru virvarhu la'el kol yitzurav, all of his yitzurim, the things that he formed, his fashion, his creatures, will glorify and bless God. Shevach, yikar ugedula yitinu. They're going to give praise, honor, and um, greatness ascribed to God. Melech yotzer kol, God who created, and I've done the, messed up the vowel, the vocalization of that word badly. La'el melech yotzer kol, who created all. God, the king, who created all. Who manchil menucha. It's a nice sound to it, right? Manchil, menucha, it's very, it's full of assonance. La'amo Yisrael b'yom Shabbat Kodesh. But what does it mean? It means he gives menucha as a nachala, as an inherited landholding, as a patrimony. The language is the language of space, to lahanchil, or at least of something physical, right? If it's not land that you pass on as a nachala, maybe maybe in later life, may, later, the later development of, of inheritance law, it's, it's, um, it's not real property, but movable property. But it's still about something physical that you pass on to your heirs. But in this case, God is doing that to, for us with menucha. The combination is a little bit jarring. Why that verb, manchil menucha? But we know why, because we've seen what it's referring to in the Torah. That Eretz Yisrael is a menucha v'nachala. And the language that we use to describe Eretz Yisrael, not just menucha, but also nachala, is used in this classic early rabbinic prayer to describe what Shabbat is for us. What does that mean? Why would we use the language of inheriting land to talk about Shabbat? Let's look at one more, and then I'd like to hear what you think about it. Shabbat Amidah blessing, concluding section, source number eight. Elohim of Elevotenu, and this appears at the concluding section, evening, morning, Musaf and Mincha, four times, so the, at least in the Ashkenazi rite, which I'm familiar with, and I think in most others as well, except the ancient Eretz Yisrael one, which is another story. Um, this paragraph appears, and these, this line appears. Elohim of Elevotenu, that save him, Nuchatenu, I find favor in our light, joy, take pleasure in our, our Menucha, Etc. Etc. Vahanchilenu Adonai Eloheinu be'ahava v'ratzon Shabbat kodshecha v'yanuchuva. Pass it on to us, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai our God, in love and in favor. What pass what on? Shabbat, your holy Shabbat. V'yanuchuva, and as a result, let your people Israel, who sanctify your name, rest on that day. Again, menucha benachala. So uh, let me ask, does anybody want to comment either, either in writing or by unmuting yourself for a moment? Um, I know that's dangerous because we could wind up with cacophony, but I'm going to trust you not to step on each other as much as possible. Somebody want to comment on what you think that's about? I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. You could raise a hand and we can call on you. We can, we can write something in the chat. All the research on teaching says that teachers only wait about six seconds for anybody to answer a question before they break in and give their own answer. I'm trying not to do that. What do you think? Why use the language of the ancient, of ancient Eretz Yisrael as inheritable lands by the tribes and clans to talk about Shabbat? What do, we, what do you gain by that in terms of understanding what Shabbat is about? Can you see me? Because I'll have my hand raised. Okay, I'm, I'm unable to see everybody at once. So. My name is Yosemite Kelman. Sure, hi, thanks. Okay. Um, Where are you joining I, us? Where are you joining us from? From New Jersey. The heartland of American Jewry. Yeah. Um, the New Yorkers so, think it's them, but it's not. It's you. Go ahead. Sorry. 
What do you make of this? Yeah, I, I think it's basically a, a, an international time where we need to separate out a parcel of land to for sacred use. And I think it's when you're basically talking about the, doing that for time, what you're doing is separating out a, 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 a which I bought is a little bit different. Well, Yom Tov, what that's doing is they're telling you to do that by declaring the months in each particular year, what, what time they'll be. Ah, but, I mean, God God is part of the cosmos. In other words, God created the world in not only in the space of such and such, but in a seven-day setup, okay? So that means that the seventh day is set aside from the other days um, by Avdale in order to basically make it um, a, cosmic, a, a cosmic time, a time that's basically... Uh, sacralized, and, and, and that's why the terms are being borrowed. In other words, everyone understands what it means to set aside a place, okay, mm -hmm. basic. Mm -hmm. but, but, and, and so what I'm thinking is that God set aside a time for Menucha, okay? The way he set aside a place for um, after when push comes to shove, the Mishkan is also a place where Hashem, you know, so to speak, Shachan, yeah. you know, settles himself down. We, you know, so Hashem set for us a place to a time to settle itself, okay. ourselves. Okay, and that's time. The same time. Time has replaced place, you know, as in in some of its functions within Jewish religious life. We could. Does anybody want to jump in and spell that out a little more? Anybody? I mean, I'm prepared to. Tell you what, I've been thinking about it as well, which is, it, it, but maybe someone else. Okay, we have Cantor Neil Schwartz. Because we're Cantor Neil Schwartz, hello. Are you able to unmute yourself or do we yes. need to do that for you? Okay. Salam right. Aleichem. Hi. One Salam. reason I was so eager to um, study with you today is that I don't know whether or not you're still on the faculty of Hebrew College. The portion of Hebrew College oh, that I, was I while, did yeah. was uh, kind of closed down, but uh, for a while we were both teaching um, online for yeah. them. So glad to finally have a chance to have you be my teacher. Great. Um, well, teach us now. Go ahead. What were you going to say so, about this, this strange use of land language to talk about? Something it's something like that. that as I am seven weeks away from retirement in a 42-year career, that I am really starting to understand more and more that I think is related to the, um, the, point, the main point of, of your session here today. I have often said that given my high pressure, high pushing myself approach to life, I would not probably have even made it to almost age 70 if it weren't for the fact that I keep a very strict Shabbat by conservative standards. Mm -hmm. I've always followed the 1953 or 54 ruling to drive to and from synagogue. Once Zoom came along, I followed the new Committee on Jewish Law and Standings to um, to learn how to use Zoom. Okay, but um, I raised three kids, not only with no TV, but we even didn't listen to music on Shabbat. I like mm -hmm. to say that a result of no TV for three kids so far is one PhD and four master's degrees in one of them. <laughs> but the fact right. is, none of them is raising my grandkids with TV either. I think that wow, makes wow. Huge. But, but tell me, how does that? How do how do how do you draw something? I'm, how does I'm that relate connecting that to Shabbat. Right. Okay, what I'm finding myself doing, living on my own now at the end of my career in a, a very nice house here in a small town in south southern Alabama, is literally once I come home from our this after years of conservative, I'm finally in reform, so we have Torah study on Saturday morning. I'm finding myself not leaving the house. For any reason, I'm just resting. I'm starting to finally read some of the books I've been schlepping with me from place to place throughout <laughs> my career. I never listened, even when I'm totally alone, never listened to classical music, right. which is what I love because right. as a cantor, as a, a musician, I I understand right. music so well that to me it's it's work. I wouldn't even talk with somebody if they were sitting in wow. the wow. next time. So what what I think based on the the first half hour of your presentation today, um, my esteemed colleague, is that I get a connection between Shabbat complete rest and place. 
My home is my refuge. Mm. I raised three kids that way. We played board games on Shabbat because we wouldn't use any electronic games. So I think to this day, one reason I have the relationship that I do with my kids is because we bonded over board games in a way that is really kind of Yotzei Min Haklal um, in the transition from the baby boomer to the millennial right. generation. Right. Neil, I think what you're telling me is that, is that Shabbat, as, as, um, as the halacha would like people to, classical halacha would like people to observe it, binds you to a place and makes you present with the people who are in your immediate physical environment. In that sense, it builds Jewish community as well, something that was super important to Nate. And the, the kidding around about how he was always the last one out of Shul and Tinek, because I enjoyed a great deal. Um, okay. he, <laughs> so, but, and in that sense, it, it, it maybe re captures something of the experience of being a, free, a people um, gathered in our own land. Mm -hmm. Is that where you're going with that? That like it's it, it Shabbat becomes portable homeland that you recreate in your space, in your co private space, and in your communal space every every week. I mean, I, I do know that in diaspora Jewish life, unlike here, where I you know I see Jews everywhere all the time uh, in South Jerusalem, um, Jewish communities gather um, on Shabbat much more and holidays too. Um, but Shabbat, with regularity, once a week, you've created that, that, that Jewish together thing. And that well, is, that's part of what you're connecting back to this, I think, if I'm Well, we, but, but let me, let me, then we're let me help answer your question. Move on. Yep. Okay, let, let me help answer your question by saying yep. that one thing I've learned in this reform setting is that many people are not coming at all for our prayers. They're only coming to see other people. And in fact, the way we handled that with Zoom was I always started Zoom a half hour early to let them chat with each other until it was time for the service. And I'd leave it on for a half hour very to let them chat. It's very important so function, yeah. Exactly. For them, they're not observing Shabbat the way I observe Shabbat. But, but you're creating I'm trying to make that connection with, having been in Israel seven times nice. myself, I'm trying to make that connection of place nice. with community, with being facilitated by observance of Shabbat. Maybe yeah. that's the right word, is facilitating it. Yeah. Okay, with that, I'll shut up and let other people talk. <laughs> Thanks. Susie Rodestein. Hi, I'm going to jump in. Hi. Hi. Did, you, Hi. did you know Nate in your Brandeis days? He was much younger. No, everyone thinks I actually went to Brandeis, but I was just a Hebrew tutor at the Hornstein program. My husband went to Brandeis. Oh, that's um, right. I was, okay, sorry. Then, yes. No worries, no worries. But that's I do right. teach and at then, Hebrew yeah. college, and I teach still right so, so let both of you know so um first well, I, I bet you i was a student at brandeis yeah, yeah of sorry. course so uh so first i was going to comment as i wrote to you privately that um if teachers were to wait six seconds that would be considered fabulous wait time and right, it's less it's less than some work on that with with our with teachers it's remarkable how hard you have to work to hold yourself back because our natural tendency is to fill the empty space. Uh, right. But truly, I've really practiced it and uh, documented that experiment uh, in a number of classes at Hebrew College. And if you can just wait it out, what the people will give you back is extraordinary. Um, so I, I did want to comment uh, to follow up on what Neil just said, that in essence, he's created a mikdash me'at, He's created a small sanctuary yes. within his home setting, within his family, um, which is a beautiful thing. And on the other hand, as you've said, having spent at least 10 years of my life living in Israel, the, the way we, set, we feel Shabbat when it is, again, it's not the entire population of Israel, but it is the uh, majority population of Israel that have that as their calendar, as their part of their life so that right. here I have to think about getting flowers for Shabbat and in Israel on every corner, I'm go yeah. going to find flowers available right. to, to adorn a Shabbat table. So I think that both Neil and you are talking about a kind of inheritance. One is the kind of inheritance of a practice or belief system or values within a family structure. 
And then you are also talking about Klal Yisrael, and in this case, the people of Israel, Am Yisrael, Be'eretz Yisrael, people of Israel in the land of Israel, who are a different kind of collective that uh, also has something handed down to them as a great gift. Yeah. Wow, there's so much to say about all of that. And Lynn, I, I wanted, there are a number of interesting comments in the chat. Lynn um, said something that relates closely to what you just said, Susie. Isn't the text um, also, Lynn has um, had the privilege of being married to Nate much of their adult lives. Um, isn't the text also suggesting that rest is more powerful and more complete when in the land of Israel? Well, you know, those of us who live both the place and the time, you know, the Shabbat and the, and the Eretz Yisrael have to figure out, like, yeah, what is that powerful intersection of the two? about. Um, I work um, as a, um, the Av Beitin for the conversion program for the Masorti movement, the conservative movement in Israel, uh, as a volunteer. And um, there was a woman who converted with us, uh, to, to became a Jew by choice uh, a couple of few years ago, who said, when we asked her what, what does she need it for, she doesn't really need it. Her kids had already converted with us before. It wasn't about the kids. She said, I'm from Japan. People work like crazy there. My father worked seven days a week, and we know what kind of pressure there is on students to succeed in, in, um, in uh, standardized testing in, in Japanese uh, education in Korean. Um, she said, it was, you know, it's here on Friday, everybody takes off and like, kicks back and goes to the beach or goes to cafes and they hang out with their friends. And on Shabbat, everything is closed and everybody's home and they're with their families. And it's so nice. I want that for me. It wasn't because she'd read Heschel. That was her lived experience of life in Eretz Israel. And I thought, well, maybe we're, maybe we're doing something right. People, somebody who's, who really came from totally outside this thinks it's, it's actually a good idea. Um, I am going to suggest, first of all, I'm going to suggest that you, while we talk, you might want to look at the chats because there's some wonderful comments there. But I think we should move on and make sure we get to finish our texts. So I'm going to share with you, um, go back to sharing with you, if I can figure it out again. Um, yes, yes, this. We, um, there's another set of phrase, another, another phrase, a pair of words that comes from another, se another setting that are, are used to describe Shabbat, but it's only once. It's one very specific phrase that appears in the Torah and in the Haftarah blessings. And this time I want to look at it backwards. I want to look at the later rabbinic use and then hark back to what it's from. At the end of the Haftarah, um, uh, writes the portion from the prophets read on Shabbat morning and holiday mornings in synagogues, uh, after the reading of the Torah, um, we say this, among other blessings, this one, Al HaTorah, for the Torah, Al HaAvodah, the worship, the temple service, it means, Al HaNevi'im, and this was written long after the temple worship had been destroyed, but had, had ended, but it's still in here. Val Hanavim for the prophets. The Haftar is mostly, I think, about arguing that we believe that all the prophets are prophets of true, the biblical prophets are true prophets, not only Moses. Val Yom HaShabbat Hazeh, and for this Shabbat day, Shanatatalana, which you've given us, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai our God, Likidusha Velimnucha, for sanctity and for rest. We've seen those words many times already in the liturgy, but now another pair tossed in at the end. Lechavod Ulitifaret, for glory and for splendor. Al Hakol for all of this, Adonai. We thank you and we give and we bless you, etc. Et so, Baruch Atah Hashem Bekadesh Hashem. What is what is Kavod and Tiferet doing there? Now, who's Kavod? Kavod is honor, glory. Tiferet is splendor. It's something very visual, usually. Who's who's honor? Who's splendor? God's ours. Like what? What's that about? The phrase comes from two uses in Exodus twenty-eight, at the beginning and at the end of the discussion of the special garments worn by the Kohen Gadol, by the high priest, in the temple, in the Mishkan first, the traveling sanctuary, and then later in the Mikdash, in the temple. And its purpose is stated both at the beginning, beginning and at the end of that passage, that pericope, to use the fancy term. You shall make garments of holiness, for Aaron, your brother, God says to Moshe, for glory and for splendor. And again at the end, for the sons of Aaron, you're to make some kind of coats or, or outer garments. 
ועשית להם אבנתים, סאשז, מגבעות ועם קאפס, תעשה להם לכבוד ולתפארת, for glory and for splendor. Shabbat is for us what the, um, the splendid, splendiferous garments of the high priest were for the Israelites in their ancient cult. You looked at the high priest and you thought, wow, that's, that's a fancy getup. That's, that's an impressive investment. That's... Oh, investment, that's a pun. I didn't, really didn't intend it. Investment, invest. The, um, now I have to go back and look up the etymology of invest. The, um, somehow that's, that, that our experience of Shabbat is supposed to capture something of that experience, of visual, visual experience, of seeing the high priest at work. And... Um, It goes a little bit deeper, too, because when we read in Yeshayahu about Shabbat, it talks about Shabbat. I'm going to scroll down to that. Im tashiv mi Shabbat raglecha. If you refrain from, keep your foot back from Shabbat, from trampling all over it. Asot chafatzecha beyom kodshi, from doing your own affairs, your own business on, the, on my holy day. Vekarata la Shabbat oneg, and you call Shabbat a delight. Mikdosh Adonai mechubad vechibadato measot rachecha. You, you glorify it and go not your ways, no look to your affairs, no strike bargains. That's the, where we get the business of not making business deals, not doing business and not even thinking them through and doing them orally on Shabbat. The Daber Davar and talking about such stuff. Then you shall seek the favor of Adonai, the JPS translators say. And I will set you astride the heights of the earth. There's the word Nachala again. Let you enjoy the heritage, the inherited property of Yaakov, your father. There's a connection there of Nachala and Shabbat, which is interesting. And when we read the classic rabbinic interpretation of this somewhat abstruse verse, Bavli Shabbat, Vechibadito, Shelo Yehe Malbushecha Shel Shabbat Kemalbushecha Shel Ho. Let not your dress, your clothing on Shabbat, be like your clothing on an ordinary day, the ordinary weekday. And so Rabbi Yochanan, the first generation, Eretz Yisrael Amorav, one of the founders of, of the Talmudic period in Eretz Yisrael. This is in line with how Rabbi Yochanan called his garments, those who glorify me. So, Even our garments on Shabbat and the idea that we dress differently may be a reflection of that idea that the garments of the high priest are somehow splendid and we live a little bit of that when we put on that fancy dress, we put on that nice shirt, we maybe put on a tie. Back in the pre-COVID days when we used to go places on Shabbat and we'd put on, I, lots of men would put on jackets and ties and things, you know. Have their, have their shoes shined. Remember those days? It may be that even our clothing on Shabbat is intended to be a little bit of the high priest. And certainly, if you would just read the, the bracha straight from, uh, from uh, the Haftarah, something about our Shabbat is supposed to send us back to the glory, the splendor of the sacrificial cult and of the high priest and of that whole world that has been lost. We retain a bit of it in our, in our lives, those of us who look to have them re- have all that restored and those of us who think that it's antiquated and don't want it to be restored, we still want to capture something of the glory of, those, of that era and of that practice and of those splendid, amazing garments um, in our Shabbat. So what have, we, what have we seen? We've seen that the rabbis use language that's drawn from Eretz Yisrael, and very specifically from the temple worship, to tell us that I think our Shabbat should reflect some of that experience, that in some ways Shabbat has become either a portable temple or a portable homeland for us, that we gather as families and as communities on Shabbat and recreate the sense that we all live together in one land, even though we don't. We, um, we recreate some of the, the, the splendor of the religious experience 
and it as the best way to to conclude my portion of this talking. We have a few minutes left to talk still if we want. Is to cite Ahad Am, um, who famously said that more than the Jews have kept Shabbat over the ages, Shabbat has kept and preserved the Jews, and partly because it has become in some ways. Uh, as, an, as, a, as a, a religious and social institution, a replacement for our actual physical togetherness in one country, living the same historical experience. Jews may live many different historical experiences in all, their years, in all the lands of the diaspora over many centuries. Shabbat is something that we share, we understand, those of us who do it in, in, a, in a more traditional fashion, maybe, maybe even more so than others, we understand is something that binds us together, keeps us together enables us to have shared experiences and maybe, maybe recapture something of that ancient splendor of being a free people in our own land with our own temple and our own worship and our own unique way of doing things. Um, and I think about that when I read these blessings now, having seen those connections enriches the, the, the liturgical experience for me, and I hope it will for you as well.